This is Peter. We're, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Um, while we're waiting for the last few folks to join, I'll uh, enable the whiteboard permissions here and we can uh, tell each other where we're from. I can see that uh, someone from the Caribbean has a very big smile. I'd, I'd be smiling if I was uh, down there on the beach right now. Although it is a, a sunny day in Michigan, not particularly warm, but it's sunny. Okay, I think uh, we're going to keep keep moving forward here. So thanks for thanks for letting us know where you're from. And uh, just a little background. This is this is the first time I'm giving a talk that's based on my new book, Intertwingled. Uh, so. The bad news is it might be a little rough. The good news is you're the, the first folks to, to hear this talk. So let me just uh, OK. So here we go. Um, my name is Peter Morville. I'm going to be talking about the architecture of understanding. I'll give you a real brief uh, sort of background, a little bit of information about myself, and, and then we'll dive right in. So my academic background is in library and information science. I went uh, to the University of Michigan's program uh, back in the early 1990s. And I was one of those crazy librarians who fell in love with the web uh, and uh, decided to make my career there. So I've spent most of my career outside the, the walls of traditional libraries working with a wide range of organizations, uh, big and small, uh, for-profit, non-profit, uh, to help them uh, kind of wrangle with their information architecture and user experience challenges. And along the way, I've written a number of animal books uh, about information architecture and findability and search. And most recently, I wrote a book called Intertwingled, uh, which I, I like to tell people is a book about everything, or to be more precise, it's about how everything is connected from code to culture. And that's what I'm going to uh, talk about today. We have a, our culture tends to have a, a sort of a machine view of the organization that dates back to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we think of, of our organizations as machines and, 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 and have sort of brought a reductionist approach uh, to the way that we organize work. We divide it up and we divide our organizations up into departments and units and uh, and we, we basically break work down into parts. And that's been tremendously successful, uh, but I think we're we're reaching the limits of how far we can go with that approach alone. 
and I've begun to, to look at organizations much more as ecosystems. And I think that once we, once we uh, kind of look through that lens, there's a lot we can learn from nature. And we tend to spend too much time on the surface and not enough uh, uh, sort of looking at what's really going on. So uh, that's, that's kind of where I'm headed with, with this talk. Uh, do we have the courage to go deep? I've seen this problem on, on, on a lot of my consulting projects in recent years. Uh, let me talk about one of them. I was working with uh, Macy's.com, a big e-commerce website. And early on in the engagement, uh, my client mentioned to me, he said, we've, we've had, he said, I've been here, you know, quite a number of years and we keep having consultants come in and they're very smart and helpful and they tell us how to clean up our website. And so we, we tidy it all up and then as soon as they leave, we start messing it up again. And we keep repeating the same mistakes. And that really kind of caught my attention. I thought, well, I don't, I don't want things to work that way. I want to figure out how, how can we, you know, let's look for the cracks in the ice and see if we can kind of get a little deeper and figure out why do we, why do we keep repeating our mistakes. So here's one, one crack in the ice I was able to, to, to sort of uh, get through. When I started doing an evaluation of the website, I, I came up with sample tasks. And the first task I, I came up with was, okay, let me see if I can find t-shirts on the website. So I went to the home page and browsed into men's clothing and, and sort of skimmed down the, the list and clicked on shirts. And I saw there were casual button downs, dress shirts, and polo shirts, but no t-shirts. And I spent quite a bit of time sort of digging around trying to figure out why, why aren't there any t-shirts on this website. Well, I finally discovered, um, after a bit of Google searching, uh, kind of, I, I got back, I, I realized there are t-shirts on the site. Um, and they were actually listed at a higher level in the taxonomy and very easy to miss because of the alphabetical order. And so I, I actually had the opportunity uh, a week or so later when I was visiting with Macy's to talk to the, the merchandiser who is responsible for this, this, this category. And she said, well, you know, we're, we're organized like a department store. We each have our own department and I'm responsible for men's and we have a lot of autonomy and we're encouraged to experiment. And so I, you know, I experimented by moving t-shirts up a level in the taxonomy and we sold more t-shirts. Uh, it was a success. So I explained to her that, that first of all, you know, I, 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 this is the web. We, we can put things in more than one place. Um, and it was interesting to note that within a couple of days of, of me making that comment, t-shirts were, were listed at both levels of the taxonomy. So she reacted quickly. Um, but I made the point that uh, when we start messing around with organization, uh, you know, at, at this sort of micro level, um, we, we're optimizing the parts at the expense of the whole, right? There's nobody that was sort of taking the whole user experience into account. And I see this again and again. Um, you may have heard this sort of notion of the local optimum and the global optimum. And when we divide our organizations into parts and optimize for those parts, we're missing, uh, missing things at the broader level. And that's, that's, I think, part of the value of taking a user experience approach is, is how can we look at the, the whole experience that a user has. And just I guess one more note is it, it's, a, it's a good example where we tend to focus on the user interface and, and even the information architecture without thinking about the deeper layers of culture and governance and, and how they uh, shape what's even possible at those higher levels. So that's been part of, part of my uh, realization over the last few years is that as information architecture and as our websites become more central to the way we do business, 
we need to align what we're doing on the surface with those deeper levels. We, we can't practice information architecture and user experience without engaging at the levels of culture and governance and how work is organized. We're all familiar with the story of the Titanic. Um, and uh, it, it's become a real symbol in our, in our society. It, it's a symbol that resonates with many of us because it's not only ships that are hard to steer, right? Um, our organizations are, are very difficult to steer um, at, at both the sort of enterprise levels and, and, and at the level of, of teams. Uh, and even things like websites and software, those projects can, can start to feel, it can start to feel like you're on the Titanic and you're rearranging the deck chairs, but you know you're going to hit the iceberg. And I, I wanted to sort of use that to frame a, a little bit of a talk about uh, agile and lean methods. Uh, these have, these, these, these sort of, approaches and methods to sort of building software have uh, become, taken in a very loud uh, sort of voice in our communities. And there's a tremendous amount of value that comes out of Agile and Lean. I don't want to, uh, to discount that. But I do think that there's, there are problems and there's, there are dangers that have come along with this as well. Uh, in this diagram, we see build, measure, learn. And we hear from Silicon Valley that we just need to learn from failure. Let's just, let's just create a minimum viable product and get it out there and see what happens. And there are certain contexts in which that's really the only way to go. But I, I think that there's, there's, there's a trend in our society and in many of our organizations to discount the value of planning. And I think that that's a real problem. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit of, little personal story that may shed a little light on my perspective here. Uh, last year, I decided to go backpacking and camping on Isle Royale, uh, which is, which is a, a, a national park that's in the northwest corner of Lake Superior. I had never been, uh, I'd never gone and done the real backpacking and camping experience before, so this was completely new to me, and I was, I was a little scared, but I, and, and it, it was interesting to me that the line between inspiration and planning is fuzzy. I mean, why did I do this? Uh, I remember reading uh, books uh, about hiking the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail, and I, find, I found them inspiring on one level, um, but I also kept saying to myself, I, I would never want to do that. And then suddenly I found myself planning a trip uh, a backpacking trip. So it's interesting to think about, you know, how do we get to the point where we decide uh, what it is that we want to do. In any case, once I made that decision, uh, I did a lot of planning. Uh, uh, as you can see from this checklist, you know, there's a tremendous amount of detail uh, that you need to pay attention to if you're going to have a successful backpacking trip. And I consider playing and practicing to be part of the planning process. Uh, and I did quite a bit of playing and practicing before I ever left for the island. Uh, for instance, I tried out the little pocket stove. Uh, and I burned, my, I burned my thumb the first time I tried it. Uh, I had problems uh, with the wind blowing out the flame. And uh, I discovered how to use uh, tin foil to, to protect the flame as it was getting going. Uh, so, you know, we need to in inject more play and practice into the planning process uh, uh, so that we can uh, anticipate the icebergs and, and avoid them. I also uh, practiced uh, filling and using my water uh, filter. Uh, and this is an important thing when you're out there on the island and there's no running water. Uh, and this is kind of my answer to, to this notion of, of learning by failure. Uh, you know, with respect to, to learning by failure, it's, it's all fun and games until someone gets a larval cyst in the brain. Um, 
whether you're backpacking or building software or redesigning a website, uh, there are real consequences to our actions and the way that we organize our work. And, uh, you know, sometimes learning by failure is the only way, but when you can avoid that, uh, uh, I know what I'll choose. So I think we need a little bit more sophisticated uh, way of thinking about uh, the the relationship between planning and building. Uh, you can certainly do too much planning uh, without getting your hands dirty. Uh, you can do the wrong kind of planning, but planning is important, and it's uh, planning and building go together just like thinking and doing, and we need to be creative and imaginative in how we think about the relationships there. So I went to Isle Royale uh, to backpack, but I was also drawn to the island by the story of its ecosystem. Uh, Isle Royale is the uh, subject of the longest running study of predator-prey relationships anywhere in the world. Um, the relationship between the wolves and the moose. And it's a really interesting story because when the, the uh, scientists began their study, they assumed that they would see the, the, you know, what, what's known as the classic model of predator-prey relations. The, you know, the more wolves you have, they um, decimate the, the number of moose. And so you get more wolves, less moose, but then uh, there's not enough food, so you get less wolves and, and so forth. And, and we sort of know of this as the balance of nature. But over the period of years, what they saw is that, that that's not how things played out at all. Um, there were externalities, external forces like disease, uh, unpredictable weather that caused both populations to shift in major totally unpredictable ways that didn't fit the model at all. In fact, the model was wrong. We really didn't understand how these ecosystems work. Uh, they're subject to all sorts of externalities. And I think that's true of the, the organization as ecosystem. Um, it's very difficult for us to understand uh, how external forces come into play. And there's all sorts of unpredictable uh, surprises that that, that uh, we need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, there's a, a whole discipline um, that's sort of been dedicated to thinking about, you know, how can we understand these complex adaptive systems? How can we understand the relationships between forces and variables? And there's a lot of fascinating literature um, in this field. Um, they actually have a, a visual language for uh, talking about complex systems. And what's interesting to note is that systems thinking uh, has been around for decades, um, but a lot of people aren't aware of it. And, and I think that's because uh, it's, it's too complex for most people to deal with. A lot of folks shy away from this level of complexity. We, we want a simple answer, a simple solution. My way of thinking about this is that as an organization, it's, imp it's important that you have some people that are willing to engage at this level of complexity to really try to understand um, the internal and external forces, uh, but to recognize that uh, you also need to sort of have simpler diagrams, ways of boiling down some of the simple truths that you extract um, in order to get people moving in a particular direction. In any case, um, to sort of wrap up this section, um, I wanted to say that when I sort of started my career coming out of library school, um, I, I think I really had more of that machine view of the world, and I thought about what I, you know, my area of interest as, as the design and management of information systems. And I still am fascinated by that subject area, but I would sort of complement that with, you know, a new area that I've been doing a lot of research and learning about, and, and, and I kind of characterize that as understanding the nature 
of information in systems, realizing that, again, there's a lot we can learn from nature and from uh, how we have been able to study and in some ways uh, affect change within natural ecosystems. Okay, so let's talk about categories for a few minutes. Um, information architects are, are sort of well known uh, uh, for their work in, in uh, you know, creating taxonomies and metadata schema, uh, designing navigation systems, doing a lot of work with categories on websites. Uh, I had the opportunity a couple of years back to work with Polar Bears International on a redesign of their website. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of uh, taxonomy and navigation system work uh, that we were able to do on this site. Uh, and, and this work can actually get quite deep. Uh, for any of you that are familiar with George Lakoff and, and his work, um, you know about the concept of basic level categories, that uh, there's a level within taxonomies somewhere in the middle that resonates with people much more than the highest level. Uh, so um, in this case, uh, for instance, browse by topic is not uh, a category or a label that, that really kind of captures people's imagination. Um, but you see polar bear cubs um, circled. That's an example of, of surfacing sample subcategories that really resonate with people. And, and that particular link, for instance, is, is a very popular one on the site. So as information architects, we do a lot of work with categories on websites. But I would argue that there are opportunities to go deeper with categories. I, I think that categories really are the cornerstones of cognition and culture the way that we categorize or classify in our minds uh, shapes how we think and what we believe uh, individually and as groups. And the default way that we categorize information, we use, we, we use bounded sets. Right? It's kind of a simple, um, simple way of thinking about things as either in or out of a category. So this is how we, you know, when, when, we, when we divide people into us and them, uh, you're a designer, you're a programmer, you're a librarian, you're a marketing person. Um, it's a simple way of, of doing things, um, which is partly why it's so popular, and yet uh, it doesn't really deal with the complex nature of reality. Um, most things when you think a little more deeply about them um, are, are fuzzy sets. Uh, we don't have clear boundaries. Um, some members are better members than others. They're more uh, representative of that category. Uh, and so there's a fuzziness to the way that, that categories really work uh, that we should be aware of. And then there's there are different ways of categorizing. Um, there was a there was a missionary uh, by the name of Paul Hebert uh, doing work in India uh, 25, 30 years ago. And he was frustrated by the, the rules surrounding sort of inclusion and exclusion uh, around Christianity. And he wrote some papers and argued for this notion of centered sets, the idea that uh, there are no fixed boundaries uh, surrounding inclusion or exclusion, that um, direction is more important than location. So in his words, a, a Christian is anyone who moves towards Christ. I think it's an interesting way of thinking about categories that uh, can have value in the way that we think about the groups that we're part of or not part of, um, the, the memberships. Uh, uh, in our professional and personal lives. And I do think that, that again, we, we, there, there's a real value in, in trying to be a little more creative about how we classify and, and how we invite others um, to classify or label. Uh, I think all too often we use radio buttons forcing people to uh, self-identify as a member of a single group 
uh, when checkboxes or sliders would make more sense, uh, giving people the option to select multiple categories or to um, identify, uh, you know, uh, dif differing levels um, with different categories. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about connections. Uh, we, when we think about connections, we have very often think about connections in space, uh, links. Um, but I also want us to, to think a little about connections in time or consequences. And, and this, this thinking comes for me from the evolution of the field and practice of information architecture. Uh, we've really gone beyond the notion of, of designing search and organization and navigation systems for websites. As technology has evolved and we, we are increasingly dealing with cross-channel, uh, multi-platform environments that involve physical and digital experiences, uh, we've had to move towards a more medium-independent definition or way of explaining what we do. And, I like, I like Jorge's uh, way of putting it here, uh, where architects use forms and spaces to design environments for inhabitation. Information architects use nodes and links to create environments for understanding. Here's uh, kind of another way of looking at the evolution of, of the practice of information architecture. Uh, in the early days of the web, uh, we focused on uh, designing pages and, and hyperlinks uh, between pages. With the kind of dawn of, of mobile and cross-channel, we needed to think more and more generally, uh, and, and space becomes a powerful uh, sort of lens. And we think of the, the notion of placemaking. We're making places that can be physical or digital and we're creating paths between those places. But the work that we do has the potential to go much deeper than that. What we're really doing is um, happening in our minds, in people's minds. We have the opportunity to shape and reshape categories and connections that people are making in their minds. And I. I think we need to explore in more depth uh, the notion of sort of links across time. Uh, what are the relationships between our actions and consequences? So let me just give you a little bit of an example here from a, a project I worked on. I was working with a philanthropy on a redesign of their site. and so I first talked with a number of stakeholders, and, and there was a, a consensus that the primary purpose of, this, of the website was uh, to help grant seekers uh, I, you know, find and, and apply for the grants that, that fit their funding needs. And so I talked with quite a number of grant seekers, the people who are, who are looking for funding. And there was a sort of a common complaint that that on the current site, those opportunities, the, the funding opportunities and the deadlines, uh, the times when, when grants would be open for application, um, were scattered all over the website. It was hard for them to keep track of, of what was available. So I had the idea to create a new page uh, that, that brought together uh, a summary of all the opportunities for funding and the schedules, calendars, deadlines surrounding those opportunities. We created a really nice table that brought all of this information together. And it was a big success from the perspective of, of users, uh, the grant seekers. They loved it. It became the uh, second most visited page on the site um, after the home page. And then someone on the board of trustees noticed the page, and they saw that you know, a, a surprising number of, of the uh, opportunities uh, were sort of presented with, with an um, invite-only uh, disclaimer. 
that they weren't open for, for sort of general application, that you had to be invited to apply. And, and this, this surprised them. They weren't aware that the foundation was doing this. And it, this, this sort of recognition um, caused a whole bunch of sort of uh, ripples throughout the organization. At one point, there was this sort of, the, the, the first knee-jerk response was, maybe we should pull down the page. <laughs> Um, and then they realized, well, no, it's, I mean, it's a useful page. It's, ref it's showing the truth. It's just a truth we hadn't seen ourselves until it was all brought into one place. And over time, through a number of conversations, they realized that um, the primary, our, our foundation has shifted. We are now more proactive. We go out and we find the right people that we want to fund in the communities. Um, and we need to reflect that on our website and, and, and really our strategy has changed and we hadn't realized it. So this little web page uh, kind of caused a whole bunch of strategic conversations and reflections throughout the organization. That, that wasn't my intent when I came up with the idea for the page. It's a good example of the sort of ripple effects that can come from a, a very small change in an information system. And of course, the folks in systems thinking know uh, all about these, these uh, unintended consequences. Uh, it's a great book by John Gall called Systemantics. Um, and, uh, you know, his, his quote uh, is, is a nice memorable one. The system always kicks back. Uh, I think of Airbnb uh, and uh, Uber, uh, the ride-sharing service, uh, as examples all the lawsuits that surround those two um, Silicon Valley startups. Uh, when you introduce an innovation uh, that really changes the landscape, at some point you're going to, the system's going to kick back. Uh, in some cases, you end up going in the opposite direction than you intended. Uh, some of you may have heard about the Cobra effect. Uh, in uh, colonial India, uh, the British were having problems with the Cobras. And so someone came up with the idea, let's, let's pay uh, people uh, for Cobras. You know, bring us a dead Cobra um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll give you some money. Now this, this plan to, to cut down on the Cobra population seemed to be working until uh, someone realized that People had begun farming cobras. Uh, they were raising them in cages and bringing them in for money. So the British said, that's it. We're, we're, we're stopping this program. No more money for cobras. Uh, so all the cobra farmers let their snakes free, uh, and they ended up with more snakes than ever. Right? So when we're, uh, when we're uh, making changes, uh, we should be, uh, we should sort of have a certain amount of humility and recognize that there may be unintended consequences, and we should sort of, uh, you know, try to be creative in thinking about how might this go wrong, and what what could we do um, to prevent or at least to respond to uh, that situation. Okay, shifting gears again. Uh, let's talk about culture. Uh, if we want to affect change in an organization, uh, it's absolutely critical that we really understand the culture of that organization. Um, and that's easier said than done. The best um, book I was able to find about sort of corporate or organizational culture is, is this one by Edgar Schein, uh, an um, and, uh, emeritus MIT professor. Um, and this diagram does a nice job of, of sort of helping us to see what's going on with culture. Um, there's a top level, um, what we might talk, uh, call artifacts, the, the sort of visible organizational structures and processes. Right? These are things that are easy to see. We can, when we go into an organization, we can see what people are wearing. We can see um, the, the, the design, the interior design and layout of the organization. We can kind of uh, see what people do for lunch. And they're easy to see, but hard to decipher. We're not quite sure what all this means. Uh, to get to that next level really requires 
uh, talking with people, uh, interviewing people, and digging, um, trying to get beyond the published values um, to the espou you know, trying to kind of understand uh, what are the deeper strategies and goals and philosophies and justifications. Um, what is it that's driving this organization? And, and then, even beyond that, our underlying assumptions, the, the unconscious, um, taken for granted beliefs and perceptions and thoughts and feelings. And what's interesting is, is Shine talks about how culture evolves in an organization and the idea that, you know, when the entrepreneurs are starting out, uh, they take a particular course or path. They do things a certain way. And if those, if that approach succeeds, if those ways work, and they, and they are able to build a successful organization, then those ways of working, um, kind of become embedded in the organization. Those are part, the, the, that's, those are those underlying assumptions that this is the way to do things. And that's fine, except that those ways of working may not scale. Uh, as the organization grows larger, those ways of working may become a problem. Um, or they may not work in a new uh, environment when, when the external environment has shifted. Those ways of working may no longer work. And it's very hard for, the, for folks inside the organization to see that. So uh, this, this map, uh, gives us sort of a starting point for starting to try to understand a culture so we can see, um, you know, how we can leverage it, um, if not change it. And, and, and Shine is very clear that culture is extremely difficult to change. It's much better if you're able to align your efforts with the culture um, than to try to change a culture directly. Another interesting book on, on the subject of culture, um, Cultures and Organizations by Hofstede. Uh, and he digs more into the, the notion of, of culture at the national level, the difference um, in, in cultures of, of countries. Uh, and is a little more optimistic about the changing organizational culture. He argues that national cultures are, are as, as fixed as, as the landscape and the weather. Um, but organizational practices are not. Um, they're kind of a higher layer and they're a little more subject to change. But if you're going to change culture, you have to change beliefs. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, Chris Argyris uh, wrote about the notion of double loop learning, that most learning uh, involves we, we perform an action, we get the results, and if something doesn't work, we just change the action. We do something differently, um, you know, we change what we do or how we do. Um, but it's rare within individuals and organizations um, to change beliefs, and it's, it's that that's involved in, in changing culture. Now, I had my own experience with double loop learning uh, quite a few years back now when I was writing uh, the Lemur book about ambient findability. And I started experiencing very bad back pain. And I went to the doctor and uh, she told me to take an awful lot of Advil uh, and do, a, do some physical therapy exercises. Um, none of it worked. And I was really frustrated. I eventually discovered this book called Healing Back Pain, um, The Mind-Body Connection by John Sarno. And um, to make a long story short, uh, this book helped to explain the sort of psychosomatic basis of a lot of pain, and it literally healed my back, uh, and it really changed my mind. Uh, it, it, it basically opened up a crack um, in, in Western medicine for me, uh, kind of changed how I think about health. Um, and once you start to see through that crack, uh, you see... Uh, evidence all over the place. Uh, there's an interesting book called Hippocrates Shadow, uh, written by a doctor that, that, that goes into great detail uh, about a lot of the problems with Western medicine and the way that we treat um, pain. And uh, Nassim uh, Taleb 
uh, wrote a great book called The Black Swan and another book called Anti-Fragile. Um, he actually goes so far as to say, if you want to accelerate someone's death, give him a personal doctor. Uh, I don't mean provide him with a bad doctor. Just pay for him to choose his own. Any doctor will do. Uh, So I want to come back to that in a moment, um, but we're going to keep moving here and, and talk a little bit about limits. Uh, how do we understand our own limits, the limits of our organization, to what degree change is possible? Uh, sometimes the only way to know our limits is to go beyond them. Now, when we're changing, trying to change uh, an organization, um, there's no one right way to do things, and, and I think actually, to the contrary, it's best to, to approach change uh, with, with multiple methods, right? to, to try to think about um, how can we bring all the tools at our disposal to, to sort of help affect change. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, using information, using architecture, using behavior, and then leadership. So our default way of trying to change people or organizations is, is information. Um, we tell people, uh, don't eat donuts, you're going you're gonna to get a you know, heart disease. Don't smoke cigarettes, you're going to get cancer. Uh, and, and we know that, that information has limits in terms of its ability to change behavior. Um, people believe what they want to believe to a certain degree, and it's very hard um, when somebody has, has uh, developed habits to, to sort of change those habits uh, um, by simply providing them with more information, with statistics, uh, with data. So information is an important part of the puzzle, but it's not enough uh, by itself. Uh, Calvin Moores, back in 1959, told us this. Um, he, he said that uh, it's his suggestion that many people may not, want, may not want information, and they'll avoid a system precisely because it gives them information. Uh, you know, information uh, forces us to change our beliefs, to change our behaviors. It can be a lot of trouble. So what else can we do? Well, I think Winston Churchill had it right when he said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. Um, architecture uh, is a very powerful force in shaping our behavior. Uh, and uh, you know, what are the ways in which we can change the environment in a way to sort of nudge people in the right direction? Um, this, this book, uh, Nudge, uh, has a lot of fascinating stories about uh, the power of, of uh, changing architecture, changing environment in order to change habits and behaviors. Um, and when you think about it, that's a lot of what people are getting paid to do online is to nudge. Uh, there's a lot of nudging going on in, on the internet. Uh, for instance, uh, if you're on a real estate site like Trulia and you do a search, the default sort is um, featured results. Right? These are results that people have paid, they've paid to be listed at the top of results. This is not user-centered design. This is not, these are not the results that are sort of necessarily users want to see first or, uh, or in their best interests. Um, but uh, it's the folks who figured out how to do this nudging that can afford these kinds of homes. Now, if we're going to attempt to change architecture uh, or environment, I think it's really important that we understand um, culture more deeply. Um, when I'm working as a consultant, I feel like it's I feel it's very important for me to understand the, the culture of um, the users, uh, and also the culture of the stakeholders, the organization I'm working with. And ethnography, uh, doing research uh, in the people's natural habitat, uh, is extremely valuable way of really understanding what's going on in an organization or in a particular context. And um, 
if you want to dig into this, I highly recommend this book by James Spradley, The Ethnographic Interview. Uh, he goes into, into great detail on uh, interviewing techniques. How can we talk with someone in a way that really draws out um, their perspective? Uh, he makes the point, for instance, that, that people have developed a certain level of translation competence. If you ask a question in the wrong way, they're going to answer in your language instead of theirs. And so he advocates asking more open-ended questions, sort of saying something like, tell me, tell me about a day in your life. Um, so ethnography, I think, is, is an area that we need to dig in more, into more deeply. Uh, we need to get beneath our sort of surface level understanding of, of uh, organizations and cultures. Now, another way to affect change is directly at that level of habit. Uh, wonderful book called The Power of Habit, uh, in which the authors argue uh, that there's this notion of keystone habits, uh, habits that can have uh, a ripple effect. If you change one habit, lots of others change along with it. Uh, for instance, um, exercise. Right? There's been all sorts of research that shows that once people start exercising, uh, they often see improvements in other areas of their lives that don't quite make sense. And, and, and these authors have an explanation for that. They say willpower is the single most important keystone habit for individual success. Um, it it out, you know, for, in terms of academic performance, it, it's uh, more important than, than IQ. Um, and they argue that, you know, they make a connection here. If you start exercising and you get yourself um, out the door each day to go for your jog or your walk, um, you're building that willpower muscle, right? Not just physical muscle, but you're building the muscle of willpower. And as that muscle develops, you're able to, ex to exercise discipline in more areas of your life, whether it's st stopping smoking or eating healthier or getting your homework done. And so, uh, you know, starting at the level of habit, whether it's, a, you know, an individual's or sort of a group of individuals in an organization, can have uh, a ripple effect um, beyond that immediate habit. Okay, so uh, one more story here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about leadership. Um, and so this is a story about uh, Josie Parker, uh, who's the director uh, at the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, I had lunch with her uh, uh, earlier in the year, and she sort of told me a little bit about this story, but I, I had already read about it in the newspaper. So Josie uh, was hired uh, by the library in the wake of a financial scandal. Uh, and it was her job to help restore trust in the community. And the way she said about that was, was trying to build what she calls a, a culture of generosity, of giving back to the community. And the, she did this in many different ways. Uh, uh, they set up a, a, a variety of, of uh, games uh, that, 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 uh, that, that if you played and, uh, you know, sort of led to the forgiveness of library fines. Right, it's a small thing, but it's sort of nice to, you know, you owe $5 to the library. It's nice to have that fine forgiven. Um, at a bigger level, uh, they built uh, these beautiful branch libraries. Um, some of the most beautiful buildings in Ann Arbor are our branch libraries. And, and so that's a big visible symbol of giving um, uh, to the community. But there's also a, a personal story in here. Uh, a few years back, uh, Josie was... Um, during the, the holiday season, Josie was volunteering at a local bookstore uh, wrapping gifts. And uh, they had a, a sort of a tip jar uh, that they were collecting money for, for a charity. Well, some, some uh, uh, thief basically grabbed the tip jar and ran for the door. And uh, Josie uh, ran after him. And, 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 and she actually managed to tackle him. Um, she unfortunately fractured her leg in the process. Um, the thief got away, but not with the money. And uh, this, this story actually ended up, uh, uh, it made national headlines. Um, and, and the headline read, uh, the, the librarian who saved Christmas. Um, 
the, the point here is that you know leadership is about uh, alignment of of sort of beliefs and actions uh, and 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 acting on multiple levels uh, kind of in faith with with the, those values uh, and you need to basically I mean real leadership create stories that people then tell about you, right? The story is a tremendously powerful way of changing and building culture. Uh, and real leaders um, sort of do things that, that uh, result in story, their stories being told uh, for many years later. Okay, so I want to start to wrap up here, and, and then I'll see what sorts of comments or questions you folks have. Um, as you've seen throughout here, I've peppered a number of book recommendations. Here's three more. Um, these are three um, of the most interesting and depressing books I've ever read. Um, uh, so you've been warned. Uh, the Limits to Growth, uh, written many decades ago, uh, talking about you know, uh, the limits of, of, of growth in human civilization. Um, and it, it was a very, very famous book. It sold millions of copies. It uh, attracted all sorts of arguments for and against. Uh, and so far, it looks like they, the folks that wrote that book are correct. We are, we're headed in a very dangerous direction. Uh, I just saw a statistic put out by the World uh, Wildlife Federation a few weeks back. Um, since 1970, which is around the time that that book was written, um, half of the world's animals have disappeared. Um, Elizabeth Colbert um, wrote this book, The Sixth Extinction, recently, where she sort of revealed some of the similar statistics. Um, there are times when it feels like we're all on the Titanic and we're rearranging the deck chairs. Right? So it's, um, we're, we're living in a, in a scary time in, in human history. Um, and I, I can't say I'm completely optimistic that we're going to fix <laughs> what we've broken. Um, but on the other hand, I'm not without hope. I do think there are things we can do uh, to, to affect change uh, as individuals, um, tiny steps that we can take in the right direction. Um, so on that slightly more positive note, uh, I've been reading about this practice of daylighting rivers. Uh, as we were building up our cities, uh, we paved over the rivers, um, and this resulted in, in quite a bit of urban flooding. Well, in recent years, people have begun mapping uh, these, these buried rivers, these underground rivers, and in a growing number of situations, actually uncovering the rivers, daylighting them, bringing them back to the surface, um, which is healthier and uh, in, in many uh, kind of instances uh, creates sort of a more beautiful uh, urban environment. And I think of it not only as a positive thing that we're doing in our physical uh, environments, but also an interesting metaphor. Uh, what are those invisible currents that are running through our organizations? Um, how can we map them? How can we take the invisible parts of our organizational culture and our practices and make them more visible, turn them into maps and diagrams and models so that people can see what, what we're doing and, and actually affect change. So I think that you know, we should think about what are our opportunities to, to, to practice daylighting within our environments. So I'll close with a... Uh, one last personal story. Uh, back in September, I went uh, hiking in the Grand Canyon. I did a, a rim to rim day hike uh, deep into the, 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 the canyon. And I was wandering along thinking deep thoughts about the uh, 2,000 million year old rocks uh, and our, our, our relationship to time. Uh, when I almost stepped on this little guy, uh, beautiful rattlesnake. Uh, I only I only saw him because he rattled at me, and I was of course completely terrified. Uh, it took me several hours to calm down, and uh, 
but I did a little bit more reading about rattlesnakes, and I, I learned that, you know, when they're rattling is not when you should be worried. Um, what they're doing with their rattle is they're warning you, you know, hey, stay back on here. Uh, the, the rattle is actually a, a, a very nice thing that rattlesnakes do. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not particularly aggressive. They don't want to get in a fight. Um, they're trying to avoid that. It was interesting to me because I, you know, growing up on TV and books about rattlesnakes are always them, right? They're always the, uh, the danger, the, uh, the, the alien species. And I, I came out away from this encounter and, and doing a little bit more learning about rattlesnakes. Um, I'm not sure I would, I would say that I have empathy for rattlesnakes, uh, but I do have a better understanding of, of their behavior and, and of how to avoid conflict. And I think, um, you know, I actually feel a little more protective of them. And, you know, I think it's interesting, again, to think about our relationships with other humans, uh, you know, the folks that maybe we don't get along so well with, that we don't like. Um, are there opportunities for us to, to kind of um, build a greater understanding and, 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 and not necessarily stick with those, those categories of us and them? Because, in the end, when you look at the, the way that everything is connected, uh, that, that all of our ecosystems are connected to one another, we're really all in the same circle. Uh, we're all in the same category. We're all um, deeply intertwined. Uh, and so that's where I'm going to close. And I will just see, uh, I've got uh, four minutes or so left, uh, if there are any questions or, or comments. And there was a, I see a comment here uh, from about 10 minutes ago. I, I use the word habit when teaching my students research. Research is not hard. It, it's just different habits than they're used to. Um, so I think that's, that's a great point. Um, instead of thinking about research as this huge overwhelming goal um, or challenge, uh, to, to kind of break it down into, you know, what are some of the good habits that you want to get into? What can I do on a more regular basis or a daily basis to, to kind of um, uh, get started and keep going. I'm, I'm glad you like the rattlesnake metaphor. I, uh, I guess I'll keep that one in here. <laughs> And I appreciate the uh, the feedback, folks. As I said, this was the, the first time giving this talk, and so uh, I appreciate uh, any suggestions you have. Uh, feel free to email me. I'm quite findable on the web. Uh, I'd love to hear any feedback about the things you liked or didn't like uh, in this talk. Okay, so it doesn't seem like there's any, any questions. Again, I appreciate the, uh, the, the positive feedback and encouragement, and uh, thanks, thanks to all of you for, for being here. And uh, maybe I'll see you at some of the conferences I'm going to be at in the, the next year or so. So thanks again.